Hi, and thanks for joining me for another in a series of videos where I'm building projects from Charles Platt's excellent introduction to electronics, Make Electronics, the third edition. So today, the book introduces us to a whole raft of new integrated circuits that will allow us to implement Mr. Spock's dream scenario, the application of pure logic. So let's dive in. So up to now, the integrated circuits that we've been using, like the classic 555 here, have been fairly tolerant of a wide range of voltages. But now we're moving on to integrated circuits that are specifically designed for digital applications, uh, like this one here, and they are a lot less tolerant. In fact, they want to work with the supply voltage of five volts and for that to be a fairly constant voltage as well. And so that means we need to adjust our power supply a little bit because of course currently we've got nine volts coming in from the AC adapter. So to get that down to five volts we use this thing here which is a 7805 voltage regulator I realise that's probably difficult to see properly when it's mounted in the breadboard, so I've laid one flat here as well so that you can see what it looks like. The weird little metal plate that sticks up at the back is basically just to dissipate heat because depending on the load, this thing will get quite warm like a resistor. Uh, and the reason it has a hole in it is because if you're really running uh, high current through it for a demanding application, it will get hot enough that you'll want to have a more effective way of dissipating that heat. So you can actually bolt it to a larger heat sink to do that. In case you're wondering, the two capacitors here are for smoothing, and that's because there's something called a load transient response, which means that when the current demand of the load suddenly changes, either it drops or it suddenly increases, is that that can result in a small oscillation of the supply voltage from the voltage regulator until it settles down again. And so all these capacitors are doing is just smoothing out that little oscillation that we get when we get a sudden transient in the load. So you can see that I've got the multimeter connected to the positive supply bus and the ground bus here and it's always a good idea to just check that the voltage regulator is doing its job and definitely giving us a 5 volt supply before we connect up these chips because if we connect them up to 9 volts they will not like it. So let me connect the power here and here where the power is coming in it's basically going into one side of the voltage regulator and then what we're getting out of the other side is our 5 volt supply. If I now turn on the multimeter you can see that we are getting pretty close to 5 volts. It's just a slight wobble there. Nothing to speak of we're getting a pretty good constant supply there which is great. So now that we've verified that I can go ahead and wire up the circuit. Before we dive into circuits, let's talk logic. Let's take a scenario where a kid, let's call them Sam, wants to buy a cool new action figure from their local toy store. Whether they can get that figure is going to be dependent on two factors. Firstly, do they have the money? And secondly, does the store have it in stock? Now in the case that Sam neither has money nor does the store have it in stock, then clearly Sam won't get the figure. If Sam has no money, even though the store does have stock, well, no store gives away products for nothing, so no action figure for Sam. Conversely, if Sam does have the money, but the store has no stock, then Sam still goes away empty-handed. Finally, we have the only situation in which Sam gets the action figure which is when both of those things are true, that Sam has money, the store has stock, and therefore Sam can buy the action figure. Human beings have been doing this kind of logical deduction from the dawn of history. But in 1847, an English mathematician, George Ball, wrote a book in which he introduced a formal mathematical system for the abstract representation of logic. 
a system we now know as Boolean algebra. And this particular relationship between inputs and outputs is represented by the Boolean operator AND. It can be summarized with a generalized truth table showing the deterministic output for all possible combinations of input. Let's assume that the store does have the action figure in stock and just focus on the money situation. So the action figure costs £8.99 and Sam's weekly allowance is £10. So this time, to determine if Sam gets the action figure, the two factors are whether Sam has enough money saved and whether today is the day on which Sam's allowance is paid. Now, if neither of those things is true, then clearly Sam won't be getting the action figure today. Even if Sam has not saved enough money, if today is allowance day, then Sam can still buy the action figure today. If Sam has saved enough money, then even if today is not allowance day, Sam can still get the action figure. And finally, if both of those things are true, Sam has saved enough money and today is also allowance day, then great, Sam can get the action figure and have money to spare. So this relationship between inputs and outputs is represented by the OR operator. And once again, this can be shown in a generalized truth table. There are other logic operators and you can find descriptions and truth tables for these in the book. So what relevance does this have to electronics? or more specifically, to digital electronics. In digital electronics, we use the binary system. So we can think of false as being equivalent to zero, which we can represent with a low state. And we can think of true as being equivalent to one, which we can represent with a high state. Now we've talked generally about low and high states before, but what does that actually mean? Well, in the case of the logic chips we're about to look at, they operate with a five volt supply and a low state is a voltage level below one volt, while a high state is a voltage level above 3.5 volts. So what about the voltage levels between those two thresholds? Well, those are an undefined state and something we want to avoid. We want to make sure that our signals are always in a clearly defined state. So let's consider an input pin. If we want a pin to be in a permanently high state, we can simply connect it to the positive bus. Similarly, if we want a pin to be in a permanently low state, we can connect it to the ground bus. Where things get tricky is if we want a pin to be normally high, but with the ability to be bought low, say by pressing a button. We can't simply use a button to connect the pin to ground. That would be a bad idea on two counts. Firstly, because we're shorting the buses, which is never a good idea. And secondly, think about it. Between these buses, we have a potential difference of five volts. So when the button is pressed, what will the voltage level be at this pin? Well, we just don't know. The solution is to use something we've already seen, a pull-up resistor. So the right value resistor will normally hold the pin at close to five volts, i.e. in a high state. But when the button is pushed, current will flow through the resistor to ground, pulling the pin into a low state. And the same is true if we want the pin to be normally low, but then pulled high on a button press, except that this time we'll use a pull down resistor. A logic operator implemented in digital electronics is known as a gate. This is the symbol for the AND gate. We'll be using a popular logic chip, the 74HC08, to introduce AND gates into our circuit. This chip is powered by connecting the 5 volt supply to pin 14 and ground to pin 7. The remaining pins are divided into four sets of three pins, with each set providing two inputs and one output for one of four separate AND gates. There are further chips in the 74 series for other types of gates. For example, the 74HC32 chip is the same configuration as the 08, but with OR gates instead of AND. Okay, let's take a look at these in a circuit from the book. So here we have our circuit wired up. Here's our chip with the four AND gates. We're only using a single AND gate for this demonstration. So the inputs to the other three have all been held low. 
As with the previous chip we looked at, our power is coming in positive power to the top here and negative power to the bottom here. And you can see that the two inputs on the first AND gate are being held low by these pull down resistors, but also I've got these two buttons which can connect them to the positive supply bus. So when those are pressed, that is giving a positive input to those two pins. And as we saw before with an AND gate, if I have just one single input, so I'm pressing that button that is taking the first input high. You can see that the output, which is connected to this LED, is still low. If I do the same to the second input, it's still low. But if I depress both buttons at the same time, then we have two positive inputs. And for an AND gate, that is what we need to get a positive output. And that has lit our LED. So this circuit might look identical, and by and large it is, except for the chip has now been substituted for one that has OR gates rather than AND gates. And in this case, you can see that while neither button is pressed, we have a low output. But if I press either this button, that gives us a high output, or this button, that gives us a high output. And of course, if we have both of them depressed at the same time, that also gives us a high output. So the circuits we just looked at weren't doing much other than demonstrating the function of the logic chips. But the book goes on to suggest a more practical experiment in the form of an electronic lock. Now, we're not quite at the level of being able to create a lock that requires a series of numbers or letters being entered. Instead, this lock will have a set of eight buttons and an additional go button. The right combination of buttons needs to be held down to unlock the target circuit. Four of the buttons will need to be pressed and four should not be pressed. If the wrong combination of buttons is pressed when the go button is pressed, then power will not be sent to the target circuit. Only if the right combination of buttons are pressed when go is pressed will power be sent to the target circuit. Let's see how this is implemented using one of the logic chips we looked at earlier. The author has come up with quite a clever design using just two instances of the 74HC08 AND chip. Now, once again, I want to point out that this is a simplified circuit diagram that only focuses on the key connections and also lacks component values. For a full circuit diagram, please refer to the book. So each of the eight combination buttons is connected to an input of one of the AND gates. The difference is that the four that should be pressed are connected to AND gates that are normally held low, so pressing the button will take them high, whereas the four that shouldn't be pressed are connected to AND gates that are normally held high, so pressing the button will take them low. So clearly in the first instance, both buttons will need to be pressed for us to get a high output. In the second instance, we will normally get a high output, but if either button or both buttons are pressed, then we will get a low output instead. Now the outputs from the gates that the buttons are connected to are then combined in further AND gates so that eventually we end up with a single output from this chip here. And that output feeds to the reset pin on a 555. Now this 555 is wired in monostable mode. I haven't shown all the wiring here. Just take my word on that. So there is an RC circuit connected to it, which will generate a small delay. Now, the trigger pin on the 555 is connected to the further button, which is the go button. So when that button is pressed, that will take the trigger low, which will, of course, trigger the RC circuit so that we get a positive output from the output pin for a short period of time. Now, of course, we will only get that provided that the reset pin is high. So that depends on the correct combination of buttons being pressed. If we have an incorrect combination of buttons being pressed, then the output from this pin will be low, which will drive the reset pin low. And so even when we press the go button, the 555 will not trigger in that circumstance. So assuming everything is OK and it does trigger, then we get a pulse from the output pin that goes to the base of a transistor and the collector and emitter of this, this transistor will complete a circuit through the relay coil. And the reason for having this transistor and not having the output from the 555 directly activating the relay coil is because 
The relays specified in the book are nine volts. And of course, here we're dealing with a five volt supply for the rest of the circuit. So this does need to be on a separate nine volt circuit. Hence, having the transistor to isolate the two sides of the circuit with the two different supply voltages. And of course, the connections from the relay will then go to our target circuit. Now, this particular design has the 555 wired up in a monostable mode so that you only get a brief pulse, depending on what you want to do. I mean, if you wanted to power the target circuit permanently, then as the book suggests, you could change the wiring here from monostable to bistable so that once it was triggered, it would stay on. So there you go. That is an overview of the design using the logic chips. Let's now look at that in practice. So here's the circuit. For the purposes of testing, I've just grouped the buttons together. So these first four are the ones that do need to be pressed. These next four are the ones that shouldn't be pressed. And this final one is our go button. Obviously, if you were building this for real, you wouldn't have them in such an obvious order. You'd have them all mixed up, but it's just easier to test this way. And the main difference between the way that they're connected, as I mentioned when we looked at the circuit, is that these ones are applying a positive voltage to the input pins which are normally connected through pull down resistors so they will go from low to high whereas these ones connected to the negative supply rail their respective pins are connected to pull up resistors so they're normally high if one of these buttons is pressed that pin will be pulled low and then of course the go button is connected to the trigger on the 555 and then of course we have our transistor which is conducting the relay coil current so if we get a successful combination that will activate the relay coil and then what we'll see here will change from the red light to the green light so if i press all four of the buttons that should be pressed and i press the go button you can see the green light comes on but if i let go of just one of them we lose it and also if I was to press any of the other buttons that we shouldn't press then we also go back to the red light so there you go there is our electronic lock working as it should do well I hope your mind is already buzzing with the huge number of possibilities that chips like these open up for us and indeed, in the next episode, the book has us continue our exploration of them as we use them to build another circuit, a quiz show style button blocker. So fingers on buzzers, join me for that.